Welcome and thank you for listening in on our latest economic outlook report focusing on the U.S. recovery. Today we'll be focusing on the stimulus and the impact the recession is having throughout the country. Leading today's economic update is Previdere's chief economist, Andrew Duguay. Andrew, we're looking forward to your insights. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nicole. Today we have a few different topics to cover. What I'd like to do is start out by giving us a refresher again of where the United States sits with the number of COVID cases. Uh, as we often reiterate during these economic webinars is that the economy is integrally tied to the health pandemic. And so we need to first monitor the health pandemic. Of course, this is what makes economic forecasting analysis so fun these days is the fact that all of our forecasts rely on essentially a direction for the pandemic coming true and the pandemic itself is a health crisis and very hard uh, for an economist to predict so we have to rely on experts and we have to rely on uh, you know, good government policy in order to get these number of cases down I think the good news since the last time we talked is that the number of new cases, whether you look at the seven day moving average or just the, the top line number, do seem to be coming off of a peak here in August. And most states are seeing declines in the number of new cases daily. Only four states are really seeing increasing cases and many of those trends are, are very mild in those, those states. However, when we look at the larger context, we're still at levels well above the, the previous peak in April and May. And so if we're thinking about reopening, we still, I think, have a long ways to go before we can relax any measures that are currently in place. This has, I think, sort of eliminated all sorts of expectations that things will get to normal before the end of the year. What we're really talking about is we could be looking at a year or more of dealing with the new reality of uh, coronavirus and social distancing and how that impacts businesses and consumers. So that mentality shift actually needs to take place amongst businesses where maybe we were first putting together strategic plans to say, how do we survive this temporary phenomena? Instead, mentally, we should be thinking about how do we adapt to a new normal that is going to last several more quarters, if not permanently ingrain some changed consumer and business habits for the future, uh, for the long term. So as the further this goes, the more that I think the shift in social habits will become permanent. Uh, we also have to think how recessions often are the big mixing pot of, of changes, right? We talk about in economics, creative destruction, the fact that when recessions and cycles happen, that often creates new industries and opens up new opportunities. And, and I think no better example of this is this, this downturn because we have all this massive social change on top of the economic change that we're going through, which is gonna create some new opportunities, but also put to rest some long held traditional supply and de demand dynamics. And you don't wanna be on the bad side of that if you're expecting demand to return in an industry where it could, that demand that is temporarily sunk uh, actually could turn into permanent. This is all tied obviously to new COVID cases. And I, today I wanted to put perspective a little bit of a look on the world because we might've actually seen a peak in the number of world new cases uh, for first time in several months have we seen, there's a cyclical pattern to that. So if I show you this data on a Tuesday for whatever reason, I'm not quite sure, Tuesdays tend to be where the lowest amount of new cases are recorded. So what you see there in the decline is part that weekly cyclicality, but also notice that the last peak uh, in cases in the seasonal weekly pattern uh, was lower than the previous couple peaks. So we could be actually reaching a crest and you can see Brazil is having a slightly downward trend to the number of cases. Uh, India is still very much on an upward trend, but maybe that slope is starting to curve. This is really about emerging markets in the US right now, obviously with, with most of Asia and Europe bypassed the, the most of the cases. We are starting to see some crop ups, new cases. This leads me to believe as that we 
had long talked about a second wave potentially in the fall is that until there's a vaccine, there's always going to be waves of this. And it's just a matter of whether it is a massive outbreak, which causes everybody to literally shelter in place, or do we learn to have some moderate level of economic activity to balance the number of cases and deaths with economic activity and jobs, which is a tough thing to talk about, but it seems like it's going to be the reality for at least two, two or three more quarters uh, still. So with, with all these cases uh, and the fact that in the United States we haven't, we've bent the curve again maybe a second time, but still haven't gotten below April and May peaks, where, where does this leave the economy? And the answer is very vulnerable. And that's why the stimulus talks and decisions that are going on these past few weeks are so important to talk about. So much of the economy and so many millions of people are dependent right now on unemployment because they have been laid off. Job Jobless claims every week are topping a million new claims. And so this has left the unemployment rate at north of 10%. And there's a lot of people who've actually just pulled out of the labor market. So the actual real unemployment rate, if you consider some changes in the actual labor participation rate is well north of 10%, leaving us in a, in a very deep economic crisis, much deeper than the last recession, which everyone was calling the great recession. So what this, where this leaves us is we set up some programs to support the unemployed and that included a, blend of state unemployment payouts, which are very modest, plus a very generous $600 a week federal unemployment. That expired at the end of July. Congress has not come up with a new plan, and they still haven't as we're talking about this, but there was an executive order extending some of these unemployment benefits to the tune of $400 a week, so a slight decrease from the $600 a week uh, from the federal government that they were getting. Uh, however, 25% of that needs to be kicked in from state governments, which most states balance their budget and are in a fiscal financial crisis right now. So this makes for a very interesting case. This is temporary. Hopefully Congress will come up with something more permanent, uh, but at least we are not seeing a stimulus economic cliff like there was a potential threat of just a uh, a few days ago before any of this pat was passed or the extension was passed. So we're staving off the worst of the economic realities for now. However, as we adjust our stimulus and move forward into the second half of the year, I think the, we long talked about this is going to be the summer of, of reality setting in. This is where industries that might have been holding on for a couple months realized that the economy is not going to bounce back. This is not going to be a V-shaped recovery. And now they have the long fa face of looking at maybe two, three, four more quarters of economic downturn. How many can survive? How can we create jobs and, and move through this uh, pandemic when the economic risks are so great? So there's still a lot to be determined. We'll obviously keep tabs on the stimulus. I think right now this still projects within a band of our expectations for the economy that stimulus would continue, that it would adjust in some way or uh, phase to more reasonable levels in some way. I think what this executive extension does is by reducing the payments slightly, it kind of confirms our baseline expectation that stimulus would be ongoing, but maybe a little less generous as new cases subside at a slow rate. There's other components to this uh, executive uh, stimulus extension, including potential payroll cuts, which are quite controversial because we don't know whether they're permanent or not, uh, or will have to be paid back. From an economist standpoint of view, if you look historically at effective or ineffective stimulus, payroll tax cuts tend to be the least effective form of stimulus during a downturn. I think most economists uh, are in consensus on that. If you look at, we've talked about in previous webinars, if you look at just the, the blanket payouts, if you separate that out from what is fair, what is not, people getting paid more on unemployment than when they're working, those tend to be actually the most effective forms of stimulus if you're just looking at, are people going to take that money, turn around and spend it? Giving money to people who are in tight financial situations and giving them even a little more than what they're earning before, 
we saw in, in our last webinar, those people tend to spend that stimulus versus getting a payroll tax cut during a time of uncertainty. Most people will just use that as a way to increase their savings, which doesn't have the immediate economic pickup uh, that, that you would want out of a economic crisis stimulus program. And it could potentially, you know, accelerate the defunding of our uh, social benefit programs that the taxes support. So interesting economic dynamics to the stimulus aspect of this. As we go forward, I think from an economic standpoint, our outlook on the second half of the year remains largely the same, given the fact that the stimulus is ongoing, we would expect that these extensions continue for uh, some level for that, you know, $400 a week stimulus payment. And you could expect that we're not going to drastically change our outlook on the second half of the year. We're expecting mild recovery, right? We have never been a proponent of the V shape. Uh, the second half of the year, we do expect to be very mild, but at least not as bad as the, as the second quarter uh, here in the U.S. So, oh, we want to. We have been working on a couple exercises and in trying to study micro recessions and micro recoveries. And we started talking about different industries and how what this recession has really caused is winners and losers. Normally, a recession has this negative weight across all industries. It might start in the housing market, but it spreads to basically all industries, all sectors. What we've seen during this downturn is that because some industries have been forced to close, the share of wallet is such a big, important part of this recession that you're getting some industries that have turned out to be winners because they're just collecting more of a share of wallet, even if that wallet is shrinking because other competitors are either going out of business or forced to close, drastically shifting the way people are spending money. Interestingly enough, this is also applying to geographies. Where you are in the United States actually really matters substantially during this downturn and more than in previous downturns. And I want to show you guys a couple examples of this. So we're calling this micro recessions and micro, re micro recoveries and the fact that geography matters. So in this screenshot here, uh, the restaurant industry is obviously a good example of this. This is uh, data from Open Table a Reservation website. This is the annual change in seated diners. And if you look at before COVID happened, there was relatively little small gaps between every single state and, and performance of people eating at restaurants. And then as the downturn happened, what you saw is that actually everywhere went uniform in the fact that people weren't eating out. Uh, there was maybe it was executed at a state level, but states were pretty consistent in how they laid out that we shouldn't be dining out and you see in April virtually no performance. The interesting thing is you don't come in, go out of recessions the way you come in. And, and we've been saying that theme a long time. But if you look at the recoveries in the restaurant industry, the ranges are very wide. And this obviously matters by the number of cases, matters on state level policy and how aggressive they are in trying to combat those cases and the level of comfortability people used in going out to eat. And it also can matter on whether a state is heavily dependent on tourism or other industries that have also taken a hit during the downturn. So where you do business, if your business has certain geographic aspects to it across the US focused in different states, different industries, you're going to have to start to think about geographic specific economic indicators even more during this downturn. Now, an interesting fact is that in every downturn, geography tends to exacerbate differences in economic performance. In other words, when the economy is running smoothly, the difference between any one state and any other state is often very small. But during downturns, economic differences tend to stratify. And you can have some states that are very that perform okay and can even be shelters during a downturn. Then you have other states that perform very negatively. They might have an overexposure to an industry such as Nevada with the housing market in the 2008 downturn. Uh, the, the, the breadth widens uh, from state to state during a downturn. However, when we look at this particular recession, uh, we've seen even wider uh, differences from state to state. So here's first an example of 
looking across all the different states. And a data set I like to use and I pulled from this is the Philadelphia Federal Reserve has what they call these state coincident indexes. And these are a basket of indicators that are all state specific and they're indexed to GDP. So they're really meant to be a overall economic performance at the state level that is reflective of the entire state economy. So this accounts for average hours, unemployment, wages, and, and indexes them all together. This is the change over the past three months. So we know that the US as a whole is going through recession and that every state, most every state, there's maybe three right now, or I guess two, Utah and, and Arkansas, uh, that are not actually experiencing recession at this point. Everyone's going through recession. What is different this time is the, the broad differences in how severe that recession is. So reasons for this, um, okay, so those states that have been more relatively lax in their restrictions, which has benefited their economies, but has resulted in an increase in new COVID cases, such as those states, mainly in the Southeast and the Mid-Southwest. But you also think about the different industries that matter in a states that rely heavily on tourism, particularly by air travel, and, and Hawaii being a great example of this, are seeing strong negative ramifications from this this virus. And then also think about the, the crash that happened in the oil and gas markets. That's going to impact other states that rely more heavily on the energy sector. Think of North Dakota and the shale drilling that goes on there and the negative impacts that you see. How does this stack up versus other economic cycles? Well, let's take a historic look. And this blue line across this chart is what all those state indexes are summed up together to make a total US index. And what we did is we mapped this out against whatever the maximum or the best performing state at any given point in time was. Uh, and the minimum was the worst performing state is at any given time. Now that gap is what you see at the bottom of this chart in the purple. And so what you can see is that the gaps tend to widen during downturns. This is the case back in the recessions in the 1980s, the twin recessions, the 1990 recession, as well as the Great Recession of 2008 to 2009, you did see the divergence between states, the best performing and the worst performing states did widen. And during periods of positive economic performance, states tended to perform much more similarly. But you look at the most recent crisis and that tops them all. The gaps between the best performing states and the worst performing states is much wider this time and much wider than we've seen at any recession at any point in the history dating back to the 1980s. So we have a good 40 year sample here. So what this means for businesses is that you're gonna need to focus in and hone in on your forecasting abilities by geographic level as well as by industry segment and category segment to be able to know where there are growth opportunities or where there's downside risk. This is gonna be increasingly important as we move through this recession, because as we saw, recessions might happen very quickly on the downturn, but during recovery, it tends to be long and it tends to be volatile. And we're likely to see a lot of volatility state by state as we move through. Some things to consider about what states are likely to outperform others, we mentioned before. Think about how their reaction to the COVID cases are and their number of COVID cases. If they have a, if they're trending down lower, that's going to be more beneficial to opening their 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 policies back up to allowing more business to resume. Are they in an industry or heavily focused in industries that can recover from this? I think. For those that those states such as Hawaii that rely heavily on air travel, it might be challenging for quite a while before people get comfortable going back and flying and resuming that type of tourism transactions like they had in the past. I think also about the impact 
effects of normally recession-proof or industries uh, such as education uh, are having all sorts of issues right now with uh, do they resume classes? Do they bring back students? Are the students going to be able to go out and uh, do anything and spend in the local economy? Uh, there's going to be lots of different challenges to different areas that they might not have faced in previous downturns as well. And then we have that also urban density versus suburban or rural divide where people are looking to expand out of cities, get more space, social distancing, and that's showing up in the housing markets right now significantly. And so for more urban focused states and geographic regions, that this could bring some challenges to the economy for years to come uh, if you have people looking to permanently uh, relocate outside of, of an area and take all of that uh, economic performance with them to some other area. And other areas could benefit from this if they are uh, set up and situated to be more social distance friendly place to live. So a lot of things to consider, but I think the main thing theme here is that uh, geography certainly matters when we uh, start to diagnose the economic performance and what are the main causes and differences uh, across the U.S. Thank you, Andrew. Great insights um, and complex breakdown on the micro recessions and recoveries based on geography. That concludes this economic update. If you have any questions for Andrew, please feel free to contact us at the contact information on the screen. Stay tuned for follow-up presentations. Thank you.